Well, thanks for wonderful talks so far today. Um, it's been really exciting to hear about the past and think about the future possibilities of PME. Uh, next up, we'd like to highlight some of PME's most exciting scientific milestones and accomplishments from the last 10 years. And to lead this discussion, I am delighted and honored to introduce three of my extremely distinguished colleagues, Professor Ashish Clerk, Professor Stuart Rowan, and Professor Melody Schwartz. So first up, Professor Clerk will be presenting PME's contributions to the quantum revolution. Professor Clerk is a prominent quantum theorist who was recruited here to UChicago in 2017. We were lucky to steal him away from McGill University in Canada, where among many other accolades, including an NSERC Stacy Fellowship and a Sloan Fellowship, he was awarded the Rutherford Medal by the Royal Society of Canada for outstanding contributions to research. And just last year, Ash was awarded, uh, named a Simons Investigator in Theoretical Physics. His lab focuses on theory and computation for quantum technologies, particularly on problems related to the coupling between quantum systems and their noisy environments. We usually think of this coupling uh, as detrimental, leading to decoherence and therefore degradation of quantum states, for example, but, but Ash and his group have shown many instances where this coupling can be advantageous, allowing access to novel quantum states and information, and suggesting strategies for new hardware and algorithmic implementation for quantum computing that mitigates or even takes benefit from these dissipative effects. At least, that's my understanding of it. So I'll turn it over now to Ash to tell you a little bit more about all that and much more that's been going on in quantum here at PME. Great, and let's get this going. Perfect. So thank you so much, Allison, for that perhaps overly generous uh, introduction. I do appreciate it. I'm really happy to have a chance to tell you about quantum engineering in the PME, tell you about what makes our approach to this growing field unique, and tell you a little bit about uh, some of the key scientific accomplishments over the last 10 years. So I know this is a pretty broad audience. I think it was good to start with a, a very broad and general question, which is, what exactly is quantum engineering? So we just heard a beautiful discussion of what engineering is, right? So this is an attempt to answer this question using PowerPoint clip art, right? So the right side of the equation, engineering. John Anderson just told us a little bit about how to think about that. But the left side of this equation, quantum mechanics, for most of us, that's a bit more of a murky thing. So something involving complicated equations and subatomic particles. So to answer this question, what is quantum engineering? Maybe we should step back a bit. Maybe we should actually ask a more basic question. What is quantum physics? Or more specifically, what do you need to know about quantum physics if you're interested in applications? Okay, and we can really boil that down, I think, to one sort of statement. It's the statement I have up on this slide. The thing you need to know about quantum physics, if you care about these exciting new applications, is that the laws of physics allow for super strange behavior in really small things. So on the right of this slide, I have a kind of line that's sort of demarcating different length scales. We're going from the big to the small as we go from left to right. For things that are close to our everyday macroscopic world or not that much smaller, the ordinary laws of classical physics do a completely fine job describing what's going on. So Newton's laws, F equals ma, that's all you really need to know about. As we get smaller, right, things change. The rules of the game change. And again, in keeping with the theme from this morning, a Big Bang reference I thought was uh, appropriate. So as we get smaller, right, the rules of the game change, we have quantum physics. And again, for the purposes of what I'm going to tell you, all you need to know about that is, in the quantum realm, things are possible that would be impossible in the, uh, in the classical world. So what are examples of that? So the first example is this idea of quantum superposition, something we take for granted in the classical world. Objects have definite properties. I give you a light bulb, it's on or it's off. In the quantum world, things can be more complicated. So we could have a light bulb that is in this funny superposition state at the right of that slide. It's in some sense both on and off. And so I'm not talking about a dimmer switch here. I'm talking about something a little bit more complicated. If you could prepare a light bulb in that funny quantum state, well, if you actually tried to measure it, half the time you'd see that it's on, half the time you'd see it's off. But if you don't measure it, 
the way this light bulb would evolve in time, the way it changes, reflects both those possibilities. So something completely strange, no direct analog in anything in the classical world, something we might be able to exploit for new kinds of technologies. Okay, and so what's another um, strange aspect of the quantum world? Well, this is this idea of quantum entanglement. So in quantum mechanics, two objects that are not physically connected in any way, they might be completely distant from one another, they can still be correlated or intertwined in a way that makes no sense classically. So here's an animation, I think, from Quantum Magazine that I think does a good job of conveying some of the weirdness here. So imagine my two quantum objects are two balls, okay, and either one could be red or blue, and they're in this funny entangled state. And they're completely distant from one another, they're not connected in any definite way. So if you measure one of them, and that's what that hand is trying to indicate, you'll randomly find, well, 50% chance it's blue, 50% chance it's red. But as soon as you make that measurement, it forces the other ball to be the opposite color, okay? seemingly instantaneously. So that's pretty weird. It gets weirder the more that you think about it. Right? I've drawn a ghost here. This is what Einstein famously hated and called spooky action at a distance. Okay? So stepping back, the, the one thing you know about, need to know about quantum physics, we get to really small things. Weird stuff happens. That weird stuff has no analog in the classical world. So now we can go back to the question we started with. What is quantum engineering? Well, very simply, we want to harness these completely strange non-classical phenomena to build radical transformative new kinds of technology. So again, in the quantum world, things that can, hap can happen that have no classical analog in principle, that gives us the potential to transcend the limits of any technology based solely on classical physics. So there are three kind of sort of main sort of application areas where people are really excited about exploring these weird quantum ideas for new technologies. Each three of these areas are represented strongly here at the PME. So the first is the idea of quantum computing. So computing, digital computers, we have bits, physical systems that encode zeros and ones. If we could have bits that were in these funny superposition states, so in some sense both, zero and one at the same time, and then use these bits for a new kind of computer, will that be a radically different kind of computer? And it turns out there are certain problems that are very difficult, if not impossible, for current computers that could be very easy for these quantum computers. So this has all sorts of applications, ranging from new ways to model materials properties, to sort of doing uh, new ways of, of machine learning. So that's quantum computing. The thing in the middle is the idea of quantum sensing. So why is quantum computing hard? Those funny superposition states, that zero plus one, those states are incredibly fragile, right? Really easy to mess them up. So you can turn that on its head and actually use that quantum bit as a kind of sensor. The fragility of that state gives you a way of detecting small changes in electric fields, magnetic fields, temperature, even chemical changes with exquisite sensitivity. This too has immense possible applications, new ways to probe material systems, new ways to probe biological systems, even new ways to detect new particles of dark matter. And then the last example area I have here on the right of the slide is the idea of quantum communication. So if we were able to transmit information, messages, using these funny quantum states, we could do something amazing. In principle, we could communicate information in a way that is guaranteed to be private. There is no way a third party could intercept that message, figure out what I was trying to say, without me knowing about it. To do so would, in a sense, require violating the laws of physics. Okay, so these are three key application areas. Each one, I think, has a, potential tra a potentially transformative you know, aspect to it. All of these things are represented strongly at the PME. So I do want to say something about what is unique to the PME's approach to quantum engineering, now that we know something about what quantum engineering is. The first thing I want to stress is on the education side. So really, uh, over the last 10 years in the PME, we've been offering the first PhD program in the US focused on quantum engineering. So that's something we're very proud of. We're even more proud of the fact that other institutions seem to have caught on to this idea and are trying to replicate what we're doing. So the education aspect is definitely something that sets us apart. There's also a unique aspect to what we do in terms of a diversity of systems and a diversity of scientific subfields 
that's represented in our effort. So these row of images I have here show a whole smorgasbord of different physical platforms, each of which has the potential to have controlled quantum behavior to be useful for some quantum technology. We have things that are more on the microscopic end, so atomic systems where single atoms act as these qubits. Systems where defects in solids act as your controllable quantum system. That's carbon atoms in a diamond lattice where you're missing a carbon atom, you have a nitrogen substitution. That is actually a possible qubit. We have bigger systems. So the third image you're looking at there, that's a millimeter scale electrical circuit made out of superconducting uh, aluminum, where in that system it's actually the currents and the voltages in the circuit that behave in some useful quantum way. We even have systems that don't involve any kind of material aspect, that's the last image there, where you just use light as the quantum system. Okay, so what's really unique here, it's really unique to have one institution where all of these platforms are represented in a significant way. Okay, and so that enables collaborative and synergistic research that just couldn't happen somewhere else. And then the last aspect of the diversity here, yes, quantum technologies has its sort of foundations in physics, but to turn these ideas into a real technology, you need more than just physicists, right? So there are challenges in material science and chemistry, electrical engineering, computer science. We're unique as an institution in sort of having all of those domains represented, okay? And that's something that just couldn't happen in a conventional academic department. Okay, so I do want to say a little bit about actual sort of uh, scientific accomplishments over the last 10 years. There's an embarrassment of riches here, so I certainly can't do justice to everything that's been done. I'm just going to highlight a few things that focus on different aspects of quantum engineering research and also focus on collaborative research, right? So things that really involve many groups in the PME. So on the top line here, the very first example, one key challenge for building quantum technologies is to build materials or engineer materials to sort of enhance their quantum properties. Okay, so this first example is a nice collaborative work from Julia Dali and David Auchelon, where you want to use a semiconductor material, silicon carbide, for some controlled quantum behavior. You want to use the nuclear spins in some way to act as a quantum memory. So in this really beautiful piece of work, they really developed and then tested experimentally an optimal way of controlling the isotopic properties of that silicon carbide to be able to use the nuclear spins as a quantum memory. Okay, so that's one example. Turning to the middle of this slide, another really promising area for quantum engineering research is hybrid quantum systems. If one quantum system is good, two are even better. If you can bring together two very different quantum systems and have them talk to one another, often you get uniquely new, powerful behavior. So in this middle example, and this is again really coming from Andrew Cleland's lab, but with a lot of other collaborators in the PME, they were again dealing with a semiconductor material, so lithium niobate in this case. But here what they were able to do is it's the mechanical vibrations of that solid that became a useful controllable quantum system. And the way they did that was to couple it to a superconducting circuit. And then the last example I have on this slide is maybe the, the largest physical scale example. This is an effort that involves many of us here in the PME, also people at Argonne and Fermilab. And it's this development of what is one of the largest long-distance quantum communication uh, you know, test beds. So this is the University of Chicago Argonne Fermilink Quantum Link. In the bottom right is sort of a map of the, the locations that are connected. This is a 90-mile scale optical link that you can use to test quantum, communicate, quantum communication using entangled states of light over a large distance. <laughs> Okay, and there's one more example I want to give. In this case, uh, it involves some contributions from my group. And this is now tackling something that's just a very, very general problem in uh, quantum engineering. So you have some interesting quantum system here at the very top right is some superconducting circuit. How do you get it to do what you want it to do? How do you get it to process some information, to store some information? And very crudely speaking, what you need to do is you need to play it the right kind of music. You need to send in some time-varying voltage pulse or electric field pulse or magnetic field pulse in such a way that 
the quantum system responds to it, does what you want it to do, and that all happens quickly. So the question is, how do you solve this composition problem? How do you design that waveform? Well, there's the brute force approach, which is to say, we have big classical computers. Let's just get a computer algorithm to just try all the possibilities of what we could send this, this quantum system and see what works the best. What my group has been thinking about is can we actually come up with simple design principles that let us design control sequences that work well, even for complicated systems? Okay, and the basic idea with no equations or a fancy theory talk is simple. If you try to do something very, very slowly, often you know how to do that. So if you give me an infinite amount of time to tell that quantum system what to do, I can do it. So then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that protocol that would take a long amount of time and gradually speed it up. As I do that, I, errors are created. I controllably correct those errors. Okay, and there's an analogy for that that seems like overly simple but is surprisingly uh, you know, direct. Imagine you're a waiter, you have a tray, you have a glass of water on that tray, you want to sort of transport it across a room. If you do that very slowly, it's, it's easy to know how to do that. You just hold the tray level. As you start to go faster, if you don't do anything special, the water will spill. So what do you do? Well, you just do a correction. You tilt the tray a little bit. You can get the water across the room going quickly. So that actually is completely analogous to this sort of new theoretical technique we have for designing good ways to control quantum systems. And again, it's one thing to just come up with some theory and say, trust me, this is going to work. It's quite another thing to go to an experimentalist and have them actually see that it works. So this is something we did collaboratively with David Auschelong's group. They took some of these theory ideas we had, tried them out in a real controllable quantum system, uh, looking at spin states in a, in a chunk of diamond, and really showed that these techniques work. So optically controlling uh, a spin in diamond, they could speed things up by more than a factor of three. Okay, so uh, before my time is completely over, I wanted to mention some other kind of key accomplishments from the quantum group in the PME that maybe transcend specific scientific accomplishments, but really go more towards building up the whole ecosystem of quantum research. And so one thing we're very proud of, even though our effort here is only 10 years old, PME researchers are already playing key roles in the leadership of several major collaborative research centers. So I think you've already heard about the DOE QNET Center from Paul Kearns. There's two National Science Foundation Quantum Leap Centers, again with leadership from New Chicago. The very recently funded uh, CUBE, I think is the way you pronounce it, center that focuses on quantum sensing and biology. So that's one way in which PME researchers are exhibiting leadership. But even going beyond just academic research, there's been a lot of innovation in finding new ways to engage industry, to sort of promote innovation among academic researchers, and even help diversify the growing quantum engineering workforce. Okay, so we have the Chicago Quantum Exchange, which among other things is sort of unique in fostering collaborations between academics and industry. Duality, the first US-based startup that really focuses on startups with a quantum technology sort of bent. And something else we're really proud of, an initiative that is really student and postdoc-led, the, uh, the Open Quantum Initiative. And so this is an innovative set of, of both workshops and sort of fellowships to really help make sure that this emerging area of quantum engineering reflects the diversity of society as a whole. Okay, so I'm going to put up my last slide here. I want to at least show you pictures of all my wonderful colleagues in the quantum engineering area. Again, flash out those three main application areas I told you about. Areas where PME researchers have made really substantial contributions. But I want to end by focusing on that triple question mark at the very end. So one of the really exciting things about quantum engineering, it's all very, very new. We've identified some areas where we think we could do transformative new things in terms of technology. But there's no doubt many, many other areas of potential applications that are waiting to be discovered. And so over the last 10 years, I think the PME has really laid the groundwork to uniquely be able to fill in that last box. So with that, I will stop. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Ash. That was a, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, up next, Professor Stuart Rowan will present some of PME's many highlights in advancing material science for sustainability to solve the world's emerging energy, resource, and climate crises, and to extend our synthetic capabilities and theoretical understanding along the way. Professor Rowan is the Barry L. McLean Professor for Molecular Engineering Innovation and Enterprise in PME and in Chemistry. Among many other accolades, Stewart has received both the Herman Mark Scholar Award and the Morley Medal from the American Chemical Society. He is an ACS Fellow, an ACS Poly Fellow, and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. He also keeps very busy. Uh, Stewart is currently the Editor-in-Chief of ACS Macro Letters and a member of the Editorial Advisory Boards of several other prominent polymer and chemistry journals. On top of that, he's the new head of our NSF MERSEC, that's our Materials Science uh, Research Center, and currently spearheading at least one other major initiative that I know of. The Rowan Lab employs synthetic polymer chemistry combined with structural and mechanical testing toward the development of new functional or stimuli responsive polymeric materials. They've developed new material platforms that can change their properties in response to temperature, light, or specific chemicals. More broadly, they're working to solve major challenges in bio-renewable and green materials and reclaiming and recycling polymeric materials. So, Stuart, please come on up here, take it away, and tell us more about P how PME is engineering materials for sustainability and the environment. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alison. I hardly recognize that person. Um, I it's my honour today to, to, to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the PME in, in the sustainability field. Let me start by introducing you to uh, PME's uh, research materials team. And um, this is a, a broad array of, of people, highly talented people, that allow us to be able to synthesize and characterize. And, and, and really look at the theory and modeling of a wide range of materials, from uh, soft matter and polymers to hard materials and biomaterials. So this gives a really strong foundation to do a lot of the innovative things that are going on within PME. Um, as you heard a little bit from, from Ash, material science plays a, a role in, in, in the quantum engineering thrust that we have. But it also plays a really important role in, in materials for health and, and immunoengineering. And maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that from Melody. But my job today is to focus in on the central theme, a place that's rather strategically in the center, and, and uh, on materials for sustainability. And give you a little bit of an idea or a flavor of what's going on here in, in this theme. There we go. So here's just a few areas that, 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 maybe, that, that we've kind of distilled down over the last 10 years, starting to focus in on in, in PME. And that involves uh, questions in plastic sustainability, uh, dealing with issues in water or materials resource, and thinking about energy, in particular batteries, but beyond that too. In those four areas, we do a lot of work in artificial intelligence and machine learning to help drive the engineering of these new materials. And, and it allows us to, through that, we synthesize and make and study uh, really a wide range of nano and adaptive materials too. Uh, let me go back one, sorry. Here's just a few questions that we're trying to address within PME uh, related to these four areas. Can we replace single-use uh, plastics, the current commodity materials, with reusable and, and better circular plastics? How do we ensure uh, secure, clean access to water and its uses? How do we provide reliable access to the raw materials that we need for modern technology and future technology? And how do we power that technology and make that sustainable? This is just to start off with the plastic question and issue. Uh, I like this figure because it really kind of kind of highlights, I think, the challenges that we have. Plastics have really impacted almost every day of our life. There's really nothing that you can do that doesn't involve a polymer of some description. And you can see that over the period that, that we've been sort of playing around, 
1,300 million metric tons of plastic have been produced. Of that number, about two thirds of it now is uh, uh, waste, plastic waste. And this is an issue that, of course, has made the headlines. Less than 10% of that, or of our, of our uh, usage of the material, is actually recycled. And that's a huge challenge, a challenge that we have to address. In PME, we are kind of asking the question, can we improve plastic uh, uh, recycling by developing better circular plastics that actually have the same properties as the polyethylene or polypropylene that people are used to, right? We can't get them to change to a new material, so if we're going to get society to buy in, we need to have materials that have the same behavior but are better and easier to, 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 be, uh, to recycle. To take up that challenge, uh, we really have turned to artificial intelligence and machine learning to help us design essentially the next generation of circular plastics and how to really do that. Now one of the challenges with AI and machine learning is to get the proper, well-versed data set that allows machine learning algorithms really to do their work properly. And so to, to try and address that, we're starting to do high throughput synthesis and build robots so that we can collect that data set so that on the problems, machine learning algorithms can do their thing. Just to give you one example of where we're, where we're going with that, is we're actually designing polymers, for those that don't know, are just very long uh, atoms, and in polyethylene are very long sort of strings of atoms, and in polyethylene it's all carbon. Carbon bonds are very strong and therefore hard to break down in, in an easy way without high energy. So what we're doing is, is designing these polycarbon, or these carbon backbones with degradable units in them, such that we can circularly depolymerize them and repolymerize them back to the plastics that we have. And that green, you don't need to know exactly what this data means, but what I want you to get away from that, that green uh, line there shows that we can make these circular polyethylene-like materials, but with the same mechanical properties as high-density polyethylene. Uh, think of your uh, milk jug, for example. Those polymers are made from oil, right? That's not a sustainable source. And so this is a, um, uh, so how do we get maybe more of these functional materials from, from plants or from um, more biomass sources? And this is really at the heart of a new NSF center made public, which is really how, trying to figure out how do we go from plants to batteries, right? Can we actually do this? And Jun Hong Chen, as you, the picture that you see here, leads this effort. To, to see if we can do this. And the idea is we've brought a whole group of people together. We're starting off with plant biologists who look at different growing conditions. These, they actually send the plants to my lab when we extract out the appropriate nanomaterials. We use those nanomaterials to, to, to produce bio-based graphene and then use those to make conducting inks that then can be printed into your batteries or sensors in Jun Hong Chen's lab. This is very exciting, I think. And, and, and what Jun Hong Chen then plans to do is to take these sensors and design them so that we can actually monitor the nutrient uptakes of the plants, so that we can better understand how growing conditions influences the biomass that we need to get the materials in front of us. And so I think this really opens the door to a wide range of ways of us thinking about rethinking sort of biomass as our raw resource. Thinking beyond a single plant is really at the heart of what Supratit Guha um, is thinking about with his collaborators. And they're thinking of producing, or they are not thinking, they are actually producing what they call the Earth Macroscope. And so this really is a series of uh, uh, buried sensors in fields. And here on the, uh, sort of the bottom uh, left there, you can see that up at the Fermi Lab farm. And those sensors are really to monitor continuously the water use, the flux of nitrogen and phosphorus. And that data then is sent up to a cloud and then um, artificial neural networks utilize this data to help better predict um, um, uh, what you need to do to improve soil health and crop yield. And so this is a, sort of a bigger scale of what we were doing and made public. I think at the heart of a lot of the design um, for the materials is our computational strength and we have a great team of computational
computational material designers. And, and, and this is a, one example, uh, exemplification of this is the Midwest Integrated Center for Computational Materials, MICOM. And they have developed a whole range of uh, uh, modeling codes that can be applied to quantum engineering uh, applications, as we saw with Ash, but also are applying the, these research work led in this uh, center led by Julie Galley, uh, are also applying this to uh, uh, sustainability uh, research. You see that from solar energy capture to solar fuels to clean water. And one of these examples at the bottom left here is basically using it to design new interfaces that allow for the optimization of photoelectrodes and catalysts for water splitting and CO2 reduction. And another example, you've developed nanostructured materials uh, for solar energy conversion and electronic devices. Another challenge, and, and, and maybe one that I hinted at before, is, is a material resource challenge. We talked about how maybe we can move away from oil to plants to deal with organic materials, but of course, inorganic materials also have this challenge. And this is just amusing lithium here as a prime example. So, lithium, uh, if you look at this graph here, in 2021, the supply of lithium and our demand for lithium is matched up. But with advances in lithium technology, it's fully expected, right, that within a couple of years, our, our demand for lithium outstrips our ability to supply it. This is a huge issue, and this is only one example of many elements, but this is a concern. You add to that the, the environmental damages of mining on a large scale, um, or on the, the other one, the time-consuming one, those are these are brine lakes that are used to, 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 to obtain lithium. This is a challenge uh, that uh, Chong Lu's group has started to take up. We had a little bit about this from her yesterday. But I think the really interesting thing, I have no idea about this, is that there's actually 5,000 times more lithium in the ocean than you can find on land. But we can't get it because it's so dilute, right? You can't energy the fish to get it. So what Chong's group is doing is they're actually developing new intercalatable melt and, and materials that can selectively, in combination with electrochemistry, pull out the lithium amongst all the other sodium atoms that are normally out there in the sea. I think there's, there's potential to be uh, really opening up the door to being able to more efficiently mine the oceans, if you like, for these valuable resources. Of course, one of the big uh, uses of lithium is in lithium-ion batteries. We're all used to this. And, and in the lithium-ion batteries you see here, we have a lithium um, a carbon or graphite electrode on one side, and on the other side, we have a, little, a lithium metal oxide electrode. And of course, we have to transport lithium from one, lithium ions from one side to the other, and that's done through an electrode. Today's current electrodes are actually flammable, and this leads to the problems that we've all seen in the news about batteries going on fire. There are other challenges when you overcharge or over-discharge your battery, such as the dendrite formation. This is lithium metal sort of growing, protruding, and essentially fusing out of your battery. Jeff Capel's group is really interested in how to deal with the safety of batteries. And, um, and along with my group, have developed essentially new battery membranes um, that not only are more mechanically robust to inhibit dendrite formation, but are actually also designed to be smart such, as the such that if the battery's temperature increases, it switches off the ion transport autonomously and essentially uh, prevents the fire from going. Another big issue and challenge with batteries is how do we get denser batteries, right? How do we get more energy into those batteries? This is vital, as George Crabtree mentioned yesterday, to really open the door to new technologies uh, um, um, with these batteries. And, as you, and, and you can see from this graph at the bottom here, lithium ion has a pretty good energy density, but it's limited. If you really want to make a difference and you really need to get to lithium sulfur or lithium air batteries, that's where you get the big energy density gains. Luckily enough, if you heard yesterday's story, Mother Nature sent us Chibuizi and Matruko and to deal with this issue. And the big issue here is not to get to those lithium 
and, uh, and, and metal batteries, or oh, sorry, in order to get these high density batteries, you really need to use lithium metal, not the lithium graphite that we saw before. But this open, the lithium metal is so much more reactive and has so many more challenges to deal with. But what Kibowesi and his group has done is develop new electrodes that are now infinitely more robust and allow these lithium metal batteries to be cycled over 250 times. The, older, the use of the older uh, electrolytes meant that the, the sun would be grayed up for only 20 cycles. So it's a massive improvement in efficiency. My last little story um, is, is a nod to, to Argonon and to Jay Caesar. Um, uh, the battery hub that's based out of Argon. And as George had mentioned yesterday, a big focus of Jay Caesar is on flow battery technology. So this is large scale batteries. So these are not your kind of mobile little batteries that you're looking at, it's a big chunky thing. And they can store a lot of energy. So you can think of those as, as being energy storage units really for the grid. This is actually, you see a picture here of a, of a current um, uh, um, energy flow battery that uses vanadium technology. But vanadium technology is one of those rare metals like lithium is, and there's challenges there. So one of the thrusts um, of J. Caesar is to go organic, right? And organic batteries open, open up a whole range of opportunities, not only from a cost perspective, but from a sustainability perspective, and offers the molecular tunability, or the engineering, if you like, of, of the system. And this is just one example of some colloidal particles akin to what John Anderson showed uh, earlier, but these are actually these are redox active uh, batteries. So you can almost think of these little nanoscale batteries, if you like, where, you, where they can selectively bring in two and, and uh, charge with two electrons and discharge with two electrons. And an ongoing work that we have uh, uh, with Juan Pablo's group is to really see how we can maybe apply machine learning to develop all organic batteries that would replace lithium portable batteries too. So what I've tried to give you today in my little overview of materials for sustainability, what I hope maybe one of the things you took out from this is this kind of team approach to research. There were multiple people that were there. We needed physicists and chemists and computational folks and engineers, just like Nash said that we need in quantum engineering. And maybe just one example of this goes to the number of large national centers funded by the DOE, the NSF, the USDA, the Department of Commerce, the, the, the PME faculty lead or play a significant role in. I was only able to tell you about just a few, some of the stories from just a few of these centers. But if I was to leave you with one thing, material science and PME, it's team science and engineering that I think makes it special. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stuart. That was fantastic. It's amazing how many different centers have popped up here on materials research. So finally, Professor Melody Swartz will, prevent P or will present PME's advances in engineering and understanding the immune system. Professor Swartz is the William B. Ogden Professor of Molecular Engineering and also holds appointments in the Ben May Cancer Institute and on the Committee for Immunology. In 2014, UChicago recruited Dr. Swartz away from EPFL in Switzerland, where she was the director of the Institute of Bioengineering. Here at UChicago, Melody recently co-founded the Chicago Immunoengineering Innovation Center and is the director of a new 2 million NIH postdoc uh, training grant for immunoengineering. Among her many other accolades, uh, she's a MacArthur Fellow, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and just last year was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Swartz's groundbreaking contributions to immunoengineering center on understanding and manipulating the lymphatic system, particularly as it relates to cancer and inflammation. Her very interdisciplinary research group combines bioengineering, immunology, physiology, and biomechanics to reveal how lymphatic vessels affect immune responses, and then they use this knowledge to engineer new strategies that target the lymphatic system for immunotherapy. One of Melody's projects that I think is especially cool uh, is a reconstituted 3D model system of an individual patient's tumor microenvironment, which provides a new personalized platform for screening different immunotherapies. 
So without further ado, our final speaker in the session, Dr. Melody Swartz. Thank you very much. It's a little bit intimidating coming after those two great talks and all the great talks that I've heard all day today. So it's really my pleasure um, to, I guess I'm waiting for my slides to, okay there, to tell you about immunoengineering as the bio thrust of the PME. So immunoengineering is basically what it sounds like. It's the application of engineering tools, approaches, and um, framework, really, to um, understand and manipulate the immune system. It uses many different drugs from many different fields. Some of them are written there. And it aims both to enable or facilitate clinical translation, as well as contribute in new ways to fundamental immunology. Why did the PME think this is an important uh, area? Well, when we had the opportunity to form something new and moving to the, to the PME and to UChicago, we asked ourselves, where are the most exciting new challenges in translational uh, biomedical sciences? And really, the answer is very clearly right now immunology. Immunology is having its heyday. Um, so much basic immunology has our understanding of basic immunology in the last few decades has evolved to such a point where we can start to really understand the immunological and molecular basis of some of these chronic diseases. And we can think about the potential of maybe, you know, curing some of these diseases instead of just treating them in ways that you can manage them. And translational immunology really holds that potential. Um, furthermore, immunomodulating drugs, if therapeutics, are really the fastest growing sector within the pharmaceutical industry as well, just to show you how important this is um, in the future of medicine. Okay, so of course, translational immunology has been around a long time. Um, the very first vaccines are centuries old, um, and it was really the first example of translational immunology, and it's been amongst the most successful me uh, medical interventions in history, arguably, at least in modern history. Um, you know, we were able to uh, cure, like er eradicate major diseases like polio, that, you know, the image from um, a children's polio ward in the 1950s. We don't have to worry about our children being in iron lungs anymore. Of course, um, there's a public health aspect to that, and we need to get enough people actually vaccinated to establish herd immunity. Uh, but there's also, so there's this public health uh, really success in vaccines in the past. There's also amazing scientific advancement in just thinking that, you know, the discovery that uh, you can train the immune system with a dead virus to recognize live virus and kill it before it can infect everything. And so, you know, many viruses are, have been used in this way to develop vaccines. Um, SARS-CoV does not actually use the dead virus, but uses information from it. Um, but then we also have so many um, diseases for which we still can't, we still don't have a vaccine despite decades of research billions of dollars, you know, HIV is a perfect example. So why is that? Well, it turns out that immune regulation is incredibly complex. Uh, it's not just a matter of self and non-self that's very oversimplified. Uh, your immune cells need to be able to recognize foreign antigens that are dangerous, like pathogens, from foreign antigens that are safe, like pollen, like the food you eat, like the bacteria in your gut. Likewise, your immune, cells, your immune cells have to be able to recognize your own cells when they're either infected or malignant and be able to kill them when they have to. And so it turns out that there's a lot of regulatory mechanisms that have been uncovered in the last several decades, and we now have a better understanding of how certain pathogens can overcome, can use this ambiguity to overcome that, and also how dysregulation can push the tipping point um, over to cancer or autoimmunity. Um, luckily, as I mentioned, uh, immuno translational and basic immunology has evolved so much that we now understand so much more than we ever did. Uh, we understand the way that the different immune cells, we've identified dozens if not scores of immune cell t subtypes, the ways they interact with each other, um, the molecular signaling and how the molecular signaling affects the immune response, and 
Also, um, how location, timing, and the physiological aspect of immune responses can help shape things like long-term memory uh, or tolerance. And so, this is where, you know, really we have now this really amazing opportunity to use uh, engineering principles, apply it to basic immunology, and we now know things like where autoimmune diseases uh, have, where they come from, what antigens specifically we need to target. Um, we now know a lot more about allergy and asthma in terms of the context of which these allergens are given, where they're experienced, and how that determines whether or not you're going to develop allergies. And of course, we know so much more now about cancer and how it escapes the immune uh, response in many, many different ways. And so the hope is now immunotherapy may be able to cure these diseases. And so immunoengineering really is towards that aim, but there's still, of course, more basic immunology that needs to be teased out in order to translate as well as tools and approaches to um, do that. So in the basic immunology side, we have all kinds of engineering approaches from uh, cell and molecular engineering, bioinformatics, uh, molecular assembly, um, we can develop devices and model systems in order to predict or monitor immune responses. And biomaterial scientists, molecular engineers uh, have developed many ways now to, to make immunotherapies more feasible or more useful or more safe. Okay. So I'm going to give you some examples now from our faculty, and I'm not I'm sorry that I'm not only only picking a few a few examples, not everybody, but um, autoimmunity is a great example. So autoimmunity occurs when your immune cells are mistrained to recognize self proteins as dangerous, and it attacks the cells that produce those proteins. So an example is insulin and type one diabetes. As you can see, the prevalence of autoimmune disease can be very high, especially rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there are a few named there, but there are many, many more autoimmune diseases and more diseases that are now being discovered to be actually of an autoimmune basis. Um, most current therapies are anti-inflammatory and immune suppressive drugs, so they manage the disease. Um, so Jeff Hubble's lab has been asking, can we retrain immune cells to recognize these antigens as safe? And he's calling them inverse vaccines. So he's engineering ways to just like a normal vaccine would tell your immune system to attack a, a particular antigen, his lab is training these cells to ignore a particular antigen that it, they're attacking mistakenly. And so using protein engineering techniques, molecular engineering, uh, polymer science, they have developed multiple ways. And here is just a graph of some late, latest results um, with multiple sclerosis showing that um, in blue is their engineered vaccine. And this is a mouse model of multiple sclerosis where, it's all, where all the mice will develop multiple sclerosis. Um, and then in black is the standard of care now in the clinic. Um, and so they use these, um, and then red is the engineered, is the vaccine that wasn't engineered. And you can see like they can really prevent, 100%, uh, prevent and the onset of paralysis and basically cure the disease in mice. Um, he's developed a company around this that has now phase one clinical trials, both in me, um, multiple sclerosis and celiac disease, and he's, the company has already raised more than $150 million. So that's one example. Another example from my own lab is in cancer immunotherapy, and Allison already alluded to that, but we know that there are many ways that tumors can escape immune recognition. There are scores of different targets that are being explored clinically. Um, and even most approved immunotherapies, which are only a few, only benefit a mi minority of patients, even the best ones. And so there's, there's a tremendous need to better understand which immunotherapies would benefit which patients the best because every patient has different barriers. And so we've been asking, can we predict which targets are best? And so to that end, as Allison said, uh, we've developed patient-derived in vitro models. We call them avatars of the tumor immune interface. And we can mimic, uh, you know, immune response and proof of concept in mice has been shown um, that we can mimic uh, the immune responses that we would give immunotherapies in mice 
we can show that we can give those immunotherapies in vitro and get the same results. Now, vaccine design, there are many examples, but going back to why some viruses prove elusive to standard vaccine approaches, um, there's also a need for rapid vaccine development when new pathogens arise, as we just have experienced in the last year and a half. Um, and then there's also a lot of global challenges. Even if we can develop vaccines, we still need, there's a huge need for inexpensive vaccines, for single-dose vaccines, from freedom from the cold chain to really address things on the global um, scale. And so many people in, our, in the PME, many uh, labs have been working on developing more impactful design principles for vaccines. And as two examples, um, one is, is uh, systems immunology, understanding immune sensing and signaling, and developing like computational and experimental approaches to screen all sorts of different combinations of, of immune signals to understand how um, the, they work together. And that's done in the lab of Nicolas Chevrier. And then uh, three labs, actually, Aaron Esser Khan, Hubble, and Matt Terrell, are working on materials engineering for vaccine design, not only as potential vaccine candidates, but really these kinds of studies really help us understand how different constructs of vaccines can change the way an immune response comes out. And so different pathogens, you know, some vaccines work, some don't, what, but we really don't know why. And so these kinds of studies really helped in understanding the design principles around how to make a better vaccine, which will ultimately contribute tremendously for future, uh, for these future challenges. And then lastly, I just wanted to say that since we're engineers, we have a lot of tool sets and we're problem solvers. And so many of us actually, when the pandemic hit, turned our research, our, our, research, our labs, our approaches towards uh, addressing needs within that. I'm just going to give you two quick examples. One is the lab of Savash Te, who works in developing all kinds of really cool high throughput microfluidic and, um, you know, approaches for systems immunology and things like combinatorial screening and uh, looking, like cell, looking at thousands of different responses at the same time. And when the pandemic hit, um, he applied those, his lab applied those towards looking for drug repurposing for COVID-19. Um, this is useful not only to identify drugs as this pandemic continues to go on, other than remdesivir, that could be very successful antivirals. Um, and he, used, he, he was able to screen over 2,000 drugs, or up to 2,000 different drugs. And the idea is you take drugs that are already approved, and then you screen them rapidly. And then if you can identify which ones could actually work against uh, the, the coronavirus, then you, know, you don't have to go through FDA approval. You can immediately repurpose. And so his lab was able to identify many of these hits from over 2,000 approved drugs. And this was just published in Science. Um, Another example is Jun Huang, who, who completely redirected his research to understanding how to trap uh, these virus particles when they get in the body. And so just like neutralizing antibodies, many of you have heard about Regeneron's antibodies. They're just neutralizing antibodies that help to mop up the virus. It's also what you would get when you uh, develop natural immunity. Um, but he, you know, for those people that don't have natural immunity, um, he developed nano traps that actually have used the same principle to mop up these viruses and prevent them from entering and infecting your cells. And he was able to show this in really amazing detail using actual virus. Um, here's a, a picture of um, the, the nano trap with the, vi the SARS-CoV virus particles stuck to it in green. And um, was able to show um, in collaboration with, the, right, with, uh, with Argon that um, you know, it actually could block infection. So this is really amazing work that has not only application now, but for future pandemics, for future diseases. And so with that, I hope um, I gave you a flavor, I hope you, you know, of, of what is immunoengineering and appreciate the, the enormous potential it has to transforming disease treatment. And it really has a potential 
to go from like just managing some of these chronic diseases to actually providing cures. And so in that way, it's very radical. Um, as, as Allison said, uh, we have now established an immunoengineering innovation center, which helps facilitate translational partnerships with clinicians at the UChicago Medical Center. And uh, this training grant is really important to Im expand our impact to train the next generation of postdocs uh, who are going to be cross-trained in both immunology and engineering deeply so that they can continue to grow this field as we would like. Thank you very much for your attention.